Welcome to the Esports Report. This is your host, Will Nix, and his co-host, Ashley Hodge. Welcome to the Esports Report, our lovely, lovely viewers. I am your lovely redhead host, Ashley Hodge. And here's my co-host, if I can point in the right direction here. It's way down. I'm the bald co-host, Will Nix. Nice to see you. I'm not lovely. I'm just loud. Thank you, folks. And to our thousands of listeners, hello. (laughs) Yes, our, our... Many, many traffic listeners coming from Apple Podcast. Uh, we we love you. Keep, yes. keep downloading us. Subscribe. Click like and subscribe on YouTube. So that way the evil corporations have to give us money. <laughs> and we can uh, fund the editing software yes, that we, we use for this podcast. <laughs> What's your house goal? <laughs> Pay ourselves back? <laughs> so. Hey, yeah, and so- I was just going to say, fun fact, you know, we might have a Patreon coming. Woo! Got to get it out there. Sell some merch. That's it. Y'all want some esports reports t-shirts. I know you do. So, Ashley, what are we doing today? Um, today, we actually have an interview. This is an interview episode with Cody Daniels. He is the CEO of a social media esports company from Texas who interviewed me a couple of weeks ago, and uh, I asked him if he would like to come on our show and talk about what he does and, you know, just some interesting tidbits about esports. He is uh, in-game, right? In-game esports is the name Mm -hmm. of his company, and I'm looking forward to talking to Cody. I really am. There's a lot of stuff I want to talk to him about, and I think he and I are going to get along just fine. And it will be interesting to talk to somebody in a different state. This will be our first out-of-state interview. Welcome to the great state of Texas, ladies and gentlemen. We're reaching out to you, Texas. You reach back. Welcome to the Esports Report. This is Will Nix with his co-host, Ashley Hodge. Ashley, how are you doing? Good, good. It's my birthday. It's a good day. Happy birthday, Ashley. When this posting won't be your birthday, it's my birthday, Ashley. So, Ashley, tell us about our guest. Uh, Well, this is Cody Daniels. We connected via LinkedIn, which is a great way to connect to people in esports and, uh, you know, just just jobs in general. And uh, I think we should let Cody introduce himself and and talk about himself a little bit. Come on, Cody, come on. Hey guys, nice to meet you. I'm um, happy to be here. Um, like you guys said, I'm an esports guy. I'm currently based in Houston, Texas. Uh, my company is In Game Esports. We are a media agency where we work with brands, media organizations, really uh, providing content. And that really consists of a good amount of article writing, but also social media and newsletters as well. So we do, we, we've done some stuff with analytics as well too, but Overall, just a media agency helping organizations really tell their story in unique ways. That's awesome. So tell us, tell me, tell me a few little bit more about you, but what is your favorite esport? What game do you watch? And so I'm more of a traditional guy. So I'm more of a Madden guy. And Madden, uh, uh, yeah. We're friends. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. we are. Okay. Madden guy. Uh, when you look at the major titles, the global titles, I'm, uh, I follow League of Legends, uh, but also too. I've become a huge fan of Call of Duty. I think it's in, I think it's what in the second, third season now. Um, and then, so I think the kickoff was this past weekend, but uh, I'm becoming more of a fan of Call of Duty because obviously I played it when I was young. But number one, I'm a Madden guy, follow League of Legends scene, but uh, probably the biggest fan of Call of Duty. That's awesome. I mean, that, that's a good range too. Now, actually, League of Legends, that's your, that's your, that, that's your zone. I'm going to let you talk some League of Legends, let you geek out a little bit. Yeah, um, I started playing League of Legends in 2009. I was a senior in high school when that game came out. And I've been kind of playing off and on for a couple of years. I was in the amateur esports league for a while. And then I, you know, had to get a job and become an adult a little bit. (laughs) 
I realized, you know, I'm not good enough to go pro or continue <laughs> to make money um, in the amateur scene. But yeah, I do love some League of Legends now. It's been a couple of seasons since I've played. But um, I mean, do you currently play? Are you currently like playing in the season? No, I actually don't play. However, the reason why I follow it because a lot of my clients want content about it. And then so oh, okay. to me, to make sure that I'm uh, I'm engaged in understanding what the scene is, whether it's the, the you know, the global tournaments or whatever, uh, new heroes, whatever it may be, I want to make sure when I'm having conversations with my clients, I understand exactly what they're looking for and I can relay, but also I can re relay that message to my team to make sure we're on the same page. Because when you talk about uh, article writing, you want to make sure everything is authentic and really uh, speaks to that genre, but also that 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 jargon and terminology is consistent uh, with what the reader may expect. Well, that's you know it's fascinating that you chose League of Legends because you know we're talking about other esports. League of Legends is one of the most, one of the most lore heavy esports. There is so much there, and that I mean I, I I agree with you. You'd have to stay consistent with your article writing, and your team would too, because one mistake in that fandom will eat your lunch. <laughs> yep. <laughs> well, okay. So, how can you help? Have you been involved with any high school esports? We're most that's what we look at right now. So. Yeah. And so, yeah, just to give you a little bit about. So, uh, I, like I said, I'm the owner of in-game esports, but I also work with the National Association of Esports Coaches and Directors as an advisory committee member. And so, I work with them. Uh, really, a lot of their marketing needs. So, we we write interview articles. We also do uh, social media and manage their newsletters. But I do think, based on, and I've done, I have conversations with some of the leaders, the esports uh, K through 12 leaders in the state of Texas. Um, but I haven't done that much. However, when I think about the K through 12 East, when I think about K through 12 and anything, it's the foundation of where, where everything starts, right? It's, this is where kids may or may not identify what they want to do, but they at least have an interest in what they want to do or not. At the K through 12 level, I think, uh, I think esports and also schools are trying to figure out what that actually means uh, in many cases. But as long as they can uh, identify where to bring great experiences to students, uh, and then obviously incorporate an academic curriculum to that, I think that's great. Everybody's at a different stage. Uh, but I do think the K through 12 spaces, just like the collegiate spaces in esports, the K through 12 space is growing uh, very well, uh, very fast as well. Well, that's the thing is I don't I think a lot of people don't quite understand is that we're still in the wild west mode of, of high school and excuse me, collegiate organized esports. And, you know, Ashley and I have been around since it started here in Georgia, which has only been four years, you know, four years now. Mm -hmm. well, we're going on year five, right? Ashley, we're going into year five, aren't we? Yep. And it and changes so, uh, uh, by the minute. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> changes all the time. <laughs> yep. Uh, and I, I'm wondering, what do you think the future for esports is, Dan, uh, Cody? Excuse me. Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think short term, and I think that's something that everybody sees is it will continue to grow, meaning more and more schools will realize it has a great benefits to their student base, but also uh, to the community as well. You know as I interview a good amount of people in the K through 12 space, uh, it's kind of a consistent story where how do we, esports could be that, that, uh, that channel to bring all students together, uh, whether yes. they have athletic abilities or limited athletic abilities, whatever that may be, or social issues, esports seems like that mechanism that can bring people together, which I think is a big deal. Once more and more parents get over the stigma of it, people, my kids are just playing video games. Once they, take the time to understand those benefits and then how this could also potentially lead to potential scholarships too at the college level. <laughs> like all, you know, all those things. Money. You, know, you hit yeah. money. You hit yeah. the, yes. Okay. So you and I are on the same page. Money. Once we get the money involved, we get the parents. And once we get the parent, we get everybody else. I honestly, my, yeah, I, I think and it's not, I'm not knocking any of my coaches know, knowing this personally, but I've come across some coaches from other schools and they're like, oh, esports, it's a waste of time. And I'm going, well, have you thought of it as an off-season benefit for your students? Let that body rest, let that body heal, keep that fast twitch muscle and that mind going. I, you know, and I, that's my selling point to a lot of you know, my colleagues is going, hey, yeah, they're not using their bodies as much, but they're using their minds a lot more than you think. And yep. you know, uh, 
Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, I was going to say, you know, the the best kids at sports games are the ones who physically play that sport. Hey, well, you met mine. I mean, yeah. <laughs> the, the years that I won state, I had a starting varsity football player, starting soccer player and a starting tennis player. And they were the they were the best in the biz. And, and yeah. Yeah. To me, I think what's consistent is regardless whether they're playing esports or traditional sports, it's all about the competitive mindset. Yes, that's what that's what's driving them now. Now, esports has benefits at a casual level as well. But also, if you if as a coach try to make sure your team stays together, building team chemistry, like, for example, when and when I was in high school, it was about 15. I was playing on the, on the basketball team before every home game. We would go to my buddy's house and play Call of Duty for like five hours. Yes. You know, you know, yes. if that's it, 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 it was a way for us to kind of hang out with each other. Uh, uh, crack jokes, but we but once once it was our turn to play uh, the video game, it was very competitive, right? It, and got, you, it so, got you warmed up. It got you mentally I, prepared. Exactly yes. right. We would do that uh, with FIFA. We would do hundred percent. We would do that with FIFA. I was a soccer coach, and we would do that with FIFA. My guys would get it, and they talk about playing FIFA more. They talk about playing in the game that night. We just won. Yeah. Like oh, yeah, when we get home, I'm gonna show you. Uh, but yeah, to me, I think from a competitive standpoint. Uh, it brings everybody together. Oh, I do too. Uh, Ashley, you've had some success, you know, bringing different groups together playing for you, right? I have. Um, you know, we do have some athletic and non-athletic people. Um, and it really, I think, depends on the game. Like Smash brought together a lot of athletic and non-athletic students that I don't think would have um, hung out with each other had it not been for esports. So bridging those connections is very important for me. Oh, extraordinarily for me as well. I, what I found fascinating is it's how quickly they can bond over a game when they couldn't get, get along about anything else. And I've seen that with my teams. I've seen that with my players. I just, it's, it's fascinating. I mean, the people who would not have given each other the time of day before, all of a sudden are the best of friends because they started playing a game together. Yep. I, think that's the heart of what, I think that's the heart of competition in sports, what it should do. Yeah, I agree. Like I said, when you think about sports, and we're really sports in general, it you know we always think about how it brings the audience together, like it brings it, but it also brings the people that are playing together as well. Yes. Like like playing video games is something that a lot of people have in common, whether you play professionally or not. Almost a lot of people play video games at some point in their life. That's right. something we all have in common, right? And then be able to identify with the character within the game that you may think that like your personality represents that person or mm -hmm. the way a person hair is, whatever it may be. Video games is a magical uh, place where people can come together. Uh, they can kind of be themselves or they can be somebody else. They can kind of get away from life and they can immerse themselves in a character. Uh, for example, like I talk about Madden, I can create a player in Madden, make him a quarterback, call him Cody Daniels, and I can start a franchise with him and I can be Tom Brady uh, in my mind while playing a game. That's a, but, that's a, that's a great no, it's thing. Important. No, it's important because it, what's, it, it's funny is that you were talking about a role-playing experience, which was, is the heart of, you know, the video games I grew up playing and everybody, Oh, you're this, you're that for playing role. -play. I'm like, you play Madden, just like I play Madden. And I create the Will Nick star quarterback yep. <laughs> with, his, with his 100 speed and his, you know, his gun for an arm, <laughs> you know, I mean, I mean, I, I'm, I don't see the difference to me. I'm leveling up my character, just like you're leveling up yours. So yeah. Yeah, it, I love the fact that gaming has, has done that, has brought groups together, and people are starting to see that just because you enjoy a type of game doesn't make you anything. It just means you enjoy a game. Yeah, I think it's uh, bridging the gap because it, it's fun. Number one, it's fun. It's yep. relaxing. Um, but I think it, well. it, it, it's, it's a part. Yeah, yeah. yeah some, it's, sometimes. It's, sometimes. It's, sometimes. It's, <laughs> yeah, sometimes you might want to put the controller down if things are not going your way. Uh, but overall, I think it – it, it gravitates people, and I think it has nothing but positive impacts on people and, and kind of how they want to get involved. And it, it, it brings people together. Like, it's been so many times where, like, like you guys said earlier, it's so many people that I didn't know. Like, I would be at a friend's house, didn't know these guys, but this dude was really good at Madden. So I really want to play with him, and mm -hmm. we would start, we start hanging out. So it's, it's these unique connections that – but it also, I guess, it op it kind of breaks down barriers of community and things like that. That you just once you realize, I'm oh, I'm pretty good at I'm pretty good at Madden. These guys think I'm pretty good. 
that naturally breaks down a barrier of, oh, I can go talk to him now because we have something to talk about, right? So, which is always good. That's and, awesome. That's great. Go ahead. I was going to say, and gender too, because it's the only, isn't it the only sport that's, it it's inclusive, like it allows both genders to well, res- play at one wrestling, time? wrestling still is, wrestling still is. Okay. In, in, some, in some states. Um, and, 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 but yeah, other than that, I mean, everything else is exclusive, exclusive, so. So I think that's important too. Yep, oh, I do. As, as I was getting my Mario Kart team today, the other day, I was just amazed that it didn't matter who they were, what they were. They were the best was playing with the best. And it was just fun to watch. So I have a question about like the state of esports in Texas. Uh, I was just kind of wondering if it was like similar to Georgia. Like, you know, we're growing, but there's still like a large group of people who are like, you're just you're just playing video games or just wasting time. Like, what do you think? What's like the general vibe yeah. of like, that's, like, not just schools, but I guess colleges with esports yeah. still getting started? Yeah, I think that's a great question. So to me, I'm gonna start with colleges. I think you have a good, I think when I think about the Dallas schools, I think UTS, uh, UT Dallas and UT Austin, I think are probably, when I think of there might, and then I think St. St. Edwards, um, uh, it's a few schools that are taking the lead. But I think when you, at least for me, I went to Texas A&M. When you think about the biggest schools in the state, UT, A&M, U of H, uh, Texas Tech, some, I don't think those schools has taken that lead yet in terms Thank of you. how they want to do it. In my no, 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 I've seen it here in Georgia. And um, I, a lot of our brewer and um, a lot of the smaller schools, I've had you know, them reach out, ask about play, you know, players, but the large schools aren't participating yet i mean and i'm going that to me is it's almost backwards a little bit it's like okay we can't play these big sports but we can do esports and yeah and i'm thinking y'all got the population at these larger colleges i guarantee you i'm a rocket rocket league's my thing i guarantee you you've got a couple ssls and a grand champ out there that could make yourself a competitive collegiate team and so or some semi pros out there i i i think the bigger schools are missing the mark they're going to be behind on the eight ball on this one a bit yeah, um, to me, I think it, it, it. To me, it also depends on kind of how these schools view esports. Like, for mm-hmm. example, um, I think I would assume, and I could be wrong, but a lot of the small schools could use this as a as a recruiting tool, yep. a way to build their communities, especially at these schools that maybe a private school that has two to three thousand students. So, right. I think it's a different mechanism for a big school like a Texas A and M, for example. I think they're just they're trying to navigate what that means. So. Uh, does it, do they want to, like, I spoke to, I spoke to a university earlier today and the question, and this was their athletic director, and I asked him, why did the university choose to bring esports under the athletics department versus the campus life department, right? Right. You know, and, and I think that's the balance everybody's trying to figure. He said, the reason why we brought it under the athletic department, because we want to compete at the highest level. We want to make sure that, we want to make sure we gave esports the resources we want to make sure they have the recruiting resources, they have the coaching access resources, they even the facility resources that make sure we do this at the highest level. He did say, yes, student engagement is important, but as a small university, this is a unique opportunity for us to drive, uh, to drive uh, uh, potential student attendance, uh, but also be a value proposition versus some other big schools that may be hard to compete against. So everybody has a different reason why they do what they do. But I think at the collegiate level, everybody's still navigating because yeah, these big schools probably have, you know, a thousand uh, students in, interested in do something. But right. I think it's a matter of time, but it's also identifying where does it belong. Once I think these schools identify where does it belong, then they may take those steps. I, I think it also is gonna come down to international bodies, things like that. Yeah making giving giving us that next level we do have professionals in the esports leagues but they're not i'm not saying they're not organized please understand that they're just not mainstream yet yeah. with the public and once that happens when we start seeing those future careers i think that's where we're headed next 100 percent uh and then going back to a little bit about the high school level i think it's probably consistent with every other state where you probably have a group of you know you got some schools that they're kind of innovators and leaders uh, versus yeah. other school districts, and they they tend to adapt much more. So you probably have that, like I said, in every state, they're probably uh, thinking about how they can change. But also, too, I think the biggest challenge too versus university schools got a it's a budget they have to figure out for sure. Like in uh, in university, they can they can kind of manage that. Uh, the budget is obviously bigger 
but they have more flexibility to make it work because you can right. even get alumni to help you kind of build. If an alumni is willing to donate a hundred thousand dollars, you're good to go. You're good. <laughs> you're good. Yeah, yeah. Here, here's the esports report. We're looking for someone to donate a hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, um, yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, um, you might run into, I know at the high school level, you know, we have three organizations uh, that are official esports. You have Play Versus, the High School Esports League, and Nick, what the, the, <laughs> the National <laughs> Esports League is Federation. It? I always forget what it is. I can't either. I, I, People they're never going to like us. No, if they watch this, they're going to hate us. <laughs> but, um, you know, between those three companies, you might run into licensing issues with, like, yep. um, specific games. So that's – I don't know if colleges run into that as much as high schools do. Well, yeah, I think license – yeah, yeah, I think it's a licensing rights is going to be just everybody's problem because you, anybody used to, their intellectual property is going to cause problems. You know, I was thinking, you know, Cody, what kind of services would you want to say that you could offer high school coaches? We That's our main audience right now. We're working on getting yeah. high school players, too. But what are some of the services you could offer? Well, to me, I think it's it just depends on kind of what they're looking for. I think when I think at the high school level, and it goes back to what we just spoke about, funding. Uh, and then so to me, I think regardless, because a lot of it, I'm assuming most of these schools, if not all of them, these coaches are doing this at a voluntarily level. Uh, and then so they're yeah they, they're managing different things and they're nice. doing it because they love the students and have an experience I think the opportunity could be how can you create uh, how can you use esports to drive that that student experience but to me how can we tell that experience through social media the reason why I like social media because you can measure it if you if you're looking for a sponsor for a hundred thousand dollars you can create you can create some sponsor media content and be able to measure that and see exactly what happened. One thing I think people at the K through 12 level, as they're thinking about sponsor for whatever they may be doing, you need to think about how do you measure that? And uh, yeah, no, on top. I'm yeah, sorry to interrupt. No, no, it just came into my mind. I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. I think you're right about analytics. And I don't think, and again, I'm speaking in general about high schools and in K through 12. I don't think they're there yet with analytics and they didn't understand how hashtags drive views, how, you know, how views are driven. And mm -hmm. you, your football team may be popular in your town, but your let's say your your, your national swim team may be popular across across the nation. And yeah. So, and I, I don't know if they understand reach yet when it comes to those kind of analytics. Yeah, hundred percent. The good thing is, for example, Twitter they provide a good amount of analytics for you know just a regular user. But I do think it's the transition. It's like, and it could be a challenge. Is you if you if you're going to start a program, you still got to find a way to fund it. Right. Yep. It's, it, you know, especially if it's something like esports where you, it's, you got to convince the parents to get on board. Then you got to convince the school district. Like you, you have all those hurdles versus traditional sports is kind of already solved already. But I think the biggest hurdle is like, yeah, this may be a challenge, but this is an opportunity where we can raise some money. Then we can leverage this money to buy whether it's uniforms for the players or take these players, these students, and take them to colleges and do field trips with it. Like, think about those opportunities that the, the regular student experience and the, but being able to get the local burger shop to sponsor something like you do for Little League, I think that, but also be able to measure it. Like, that's the thing about, people need to understand esports is a digital component. It's a yeah. digital game. And so everything is measured because it's digitally versus whether it's the local soccer game and it's the local baseball team that has signs all over the baseball field, like you have in almost every town of high school. Like you can have convert that signage to social media signage and you can actually measure that. It can communicate to these brands, hey, 5,000 people saw your logo last week, last month. Yes. yes. How can, what, what other traditional sport can say that, you know, everybody loves to put their logo on the, the football team scoreboard, the, the stadium scoreboard, but you don't know exactly, you know what that actually even means. No, you don't know what, if they even paid any attention to that. While yeah. in, with, with YouTube driven content or, you know, Facebook, social media, things like that, that ad is playing. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's playing, you know, no matter what. Yeah. yeah. And it's capable to kind of go national. Like if it's something yep. compelling, because you can share it and if the right, if a brand sees it or if a, an influencer sees it, they can share that content. All of a sudden, 5,000 views became 500,000 views because one person liked it 
and they had a great following. You know, that just that right there, that just added value when you work with social media. Is anytime you provide good content, you always have an opportunity to tell a great story. You get somebody's attention, which can lead to other things as well. Well, I think I find it fascinating that is that you know in this social media age, and we're we're going into year ten of the big social media boom. I think we're about to hit. You know, it's hitting its it's hit its stride. Don't get me wrong, but it's really hit its taking over the world situation mm-hmm. when it comes to media. I, I think what's really fascinating to me is that it, we've not got on board with that yet and understand that views, likes, and such. We make jokes about something going viral, but what what hasn't gone viral that we don't all know about? It's the new common experience, in my opinion. Yeah, to me, I think, and from a from a sports standpoint, I think from an educational standpoint, it's um, the ability to tell great stories is is the key. No matter it's right. no matter what level, and then everybody loves great stories about kids having great experiences and kids learning from those experiences they had, but also the impact of those experiences. If you can yeah. communicate, hey, we and you, if you can communicate it. Communicate in January 2022. We started as an esports program. September 2022, we got new equipment, uh, or we get, we went from two players to ten players, and this is why we was able to do it. We had ten parents showing up to the events. Now we got a hundred parents. Telling those stories is a big deal, and somebody's watching it. Like being able to communicate the progress you're having, the experience you're having, the fun that you're having as well, but also the the academic knowledge, being able to communicate, hey, we was able to have a local a local university come speak to our students about what esports is, speak about what mental health awareness is, communicate that these these students don't communicate in traditional sports, but they compute they love esports and it's brought everybody together. The ability to tell a story can inspire students, can inspire parents, it can inspire brands, it can inspire key to key stakeholders in the community. That's the value of social media, telling great stories and inspiring people to take action, whether they want to sponsor your program, whether they got their kids they want to play, whether they want to know more, whatever that may be, that's the value of social media and leveraging that to tell great stories. Now, I would like to say that's partially why we started the esports program, because we want to tell the stories of not only kids in Georgia, but, you know, students around around the world and what what they're experiencing and just bring awareness to it and educate people on you know video playing video games isn't some big bad horrible time wasting endeavor there's real money and scholarship opportunities and job opportunities that come along with it agree i think people forget uh, it's like a lot of us play video games in a lifetime most of us turned out fine (laughs) (laughs) well okay there's ashley but (laughs) listen listen call of duty did not make me a violent person it is when i lagged in the game (laughs) that is when i became violent yes right right. (laughs) violent video games don't make us violent bad internet makes us violent let's just all be honest about it okay that's that's fair that is i mean i you know, I, I find it interesting as I, I think you would agree with me cody on this is that i don't think people see the growth yet in this industry that's coming that this generate, you know, we grew up on, I, I'm, I'm 47 years old. I grew up playing video games since the seventies. You know, I, I'm not telling Ashley's age. She's happy birthday though, but <laughs> we're the generations who have played video games and it is a part of our life. I still play video games. I don't play competitively anymore or anything like that, but I still play games and I enjoy and, it. And, you know, I identify myself as a gamer. It is right. part of my identity and students, they have that too. Yep. And I think that's the growth that's coming is that that's the common experience that people are going to have. But to me, I think when you talk about the growth, I think it's more about uh, some people, I think they, they, they're focused on one particular segment in esports and they don't realize, they may not understand what the entire ecosystem looks like. Like for example, what the past, what the past, what two weeks, Microsoft has bought Activision Blizzard. Oh my Activision. goodness, we know oh, we saw no. that news. <laughs> yeah. Oh no. Yes. Active, you know, Activision Blizzard has, you know, or what? Sixty-four Overwatch. billion dollars cash. Yeah. yeah, almost seventy billion, whatever it may be. It's like, it was crazy. You know, it's life changed for half the people, right? But it's Activision Blizzard has Call of Duty League, 
uh, Overwatch League. All of those leagues have like developmental and challenger leagues, and it yeah. really goes down. It goes down to K through twelve, right? Yeah. And so, and then obviously, I think was it yesterday that uh, uh, ESL sold uh, in Modern Times Group sold ESL, uh, the platform for you know the the great tournament organizer. So it's you know it's you get it takes companies like a Microsoft to kind of get involved and kind of take a lead because obviously Microsoft they make the Xbox, they make the games. Now they're in. The, now they're in the competitive scene, I guess you could call it. So when you have companies like that, they can they can take the lead for the esports industry. I think it only benefits the industry. Now, who knows how they approach the Activision Blizzard situation? But when you got a company like Microsoft and the resources they have, they can lead to jobs, it can lead to better infrastructure. They can come in and say, hey, we need to have better governance. That kind of company can do that. Uh, so all those opportunities are good to go. Well, I find it fascinating that because, like you just said about the job growth aspect of this, is going to be. I mean, you're going to need the gamers. You're going to need the producers. You're going to need. I mean, you're go, the you're going us. You're go, the you're going us. You just keep going down the line, and this is a job industry coming up that we is untapped. And I find it fascinating. I don't know if you've had this experience or not, but how many game, how many companies have been reluctant to let their games become esports? And that has blown my mind. I'm going, you're just missing out on an opportunity. And I think my, I think you said we're right. Microsoft looked at Activision and went, I can do that better. <laughs> I can do that yep. better. Uh, because one of the most reluctant, and it's still reluctant, even though we get to use it, is Nintendo. Yeah. Uh, They've been very reluctant for a while. I was very surprised when they, you know, Partner, agreed partnered. Yeah. partner with Play Versus. Amateur only, though. They, they, they were very... Very much did not. They've sent cease and desist letters on pro on pro tournaments across the world, but they're allowing amateur only competition. And I find it fascinating. I'm like, you're just shooting yourself in the foot. <laughs> yeah, because you know students who play that in high school, you know that's it. There's nowhere to go for them. Right after high school. Well, I think when you think about Nintendo, I think it. it how does it align with the brand? That when you think about Nintendo, they their core audience has always been like families. That. Yeah, yeah, family. Yeah. So yeah. right now, I can see why they wouldn't do it because it doesn't allow, it doesn't align it doesn't allow, align with their brand strategy of connecting with their pro player. They connect like they connect with that kid that's probably five to fifteen or something like that, right? That's their right. demographic. Now I understand having the, having the competition in their pro side, but when I think about their brand strategy, what they stand for, they dominate that age demographic, and it seems like that's good enough for them. But who knows? Like things may right. change. Right. I was just thinking. Strategy. I was thinking this, and I agree with you about the brand strategy because that's something I, I paid attention to as well. But I, I guess my, my thoughts is, is that if you're Nintendo, aren't you tired of your gamers aging out of your games and your systems? Because I know for the longest time, Xbox, you, you, if you were still playing Nintendo when I was 16, oh, that's not good. That's a kiddie system. You need to, you know, move up to the big boy system of Xbox and PlayStation, etc. And now, however, Switch. <laughs> that Switch revolutionized that because <laughs> you see the kids walk around with them in classes because of uh -huh. the portability. But Nintendo's always been good about that. Yep. But just, I'm saying now if they embrace the, the competitive side of it as well, you, there's no aging out of their systems anymore. And you keep those, you get the hardcore gamers and yep. the, the casual gamer. I think they, I just think it's an opportunity wasted by certain companies. And again, Nintendo's all hell Nintendo, they know what they're doing. They've made it I mean, I was going to say, I'm 31, and so I'm, I'm playing Animal Crossing I've got, I've got, <laughs> on the Switch. I've got, I, I've got my Switch downstairs, maybe th maybe three of them. So, I mean, yeah, yeah I, I like what you're saying. To me, I'm sure several companies that, that's in Nintendo's financial and resources position where they can kind of make these moves. I, it wouldn't surprise me over the we're really the next rest of the year we may see more acquisitions and mergers happening where yeah. instead of them trying to start something up they may they, acquire, they buy they, they go out yeah. and buy a riot or they go out and buy yeah. an epic yeah no I can see yeah. it I'm not saying right, 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 right right yeah go and buy an established market kind of like well Microsoft just did yeah and own it that way right that's kind of yeah you see that in all industries where you identify yeah. an opportunity. What is the best and fastest way to get there? Do we need to start something and spend all those resources or buy somebody, buy an organization that has the expertise? They already have the following already. Uh, you know, what does that transition look like if that happens? Exactly. exactly. And I, I just think it's a lot of future. I think a lot of it, a lot of schools and we're, we're growing in Georgia. We're up to 141 schools, which is about a third 
of Georgia schools available playing or, or GHA, GHSA high school schools playing esports right now. And I think we'll probably be over 200 by the end of this year. So that's exciting. Uh, it is. And it, 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 now, it, then again, too, when you think about the K through 12, um, and then are you guys under, it sounds like you guys are under the esports is kind of under the athletic association. Mm-hmm. Is mm-hmm. that right? And so Georgia high school is different. Yeah. yeah. Uh, some schools is different. Some schools have their own esports association. And then some, like I was talking to the guy that uh, in, in Colorado, state of Colorado, esports is under their athletic association as well. Once, once more and more, uh, the, once more, more and more states identify what that structure looks like. Um, because I think what you don't want to have is esports be, be put on the back burner at these associations. You don't want it to be a club. You just do yeah. not want it to be a club. And I think I, I'll give Play BS credit with this. They knew where to go. They went to the National Federation of High Schools and said, hey, we'll run it for you. And then, and then we'll give you a cut of the proceeds. And so, I mean, I'm not exactly saying what, their business, what they did. But I'm just saying they went to the National Federation, which then partnered it off with I think, is it 30 states, Ashley? I think. The, yeah, I think so. Favorite? Yeah, 30 states in the United States. So they, they got a, they cornered the market quick by going the right way. Somebody knew athletics at their yeah. company and hands off to them for knowing it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And obviously the structure was already there. These athletic associations already have the structure. Right. It's, it's mm-hmm. almost like working hand in hand with Play BS to, to identify the right playbook for esports. Yes. And, and, and things like that. So. Well, they became, and I always make the analogy as an old soccer coach, they're the refereeing association. You know, it's, they they automatically, you've got to have one. You've got to have a refereeing association. So might as well start there. And then, so they're, they're both content and, and the ref. So yeah, it's, it's, it, it, it's interesting. It is very interesting. Um, Cody, I, we appreciate having you on. Anything else you'd like to tell us about uh, in game and tell us, tell us where to find you online. Yeah. And so uh, uh, you can go to in game, um, Endgame, N-G-A-M-E dash esports.com. That's, you can find kind of what we do. You can, we always showcase our clients there. But happy to be here. It's really, I think, the mission of the company has always been how do we help our clients tell great stories? But also, we, always, we also feel, we also believe that regardless of where you are in esports, your job as an organization is to help tell great stories because that way, the more and more we talk about the great things about esports, but also being transparent about esports, I think it benefits the entire ecosystem, bringing in more brands. I think, for just going back to it, when you got a Microsoft, a global, probably a top 10 brand doing more and more esports, that only opens eyes. Uh, obviously, the cryptocurrency way movement has got into esports too. But when you got a Microsoft getting involved, other brands pay attention. Uh, uh, and if they if they were already paying attention, this might lead them to take another step. This will inspire them to do more, which benefits everybody from K through twelve all the way to the pro scene. Very much couldn't say it better myself, Cody. Thanks for having. Thank you for being with us. Give us a tweet, a shout out. Let us know where you are. We will definitely do it for you. Keep spreading it. Keep working it. Stay stay strong with esports, man. We want to see more of you. Sounds good. Stay safe, guys, and uh, have a good rest of your day. You too. Hey, folks, this is our new segment. It's a minute rant, and I'm going to start it off today. I have a rant with Nick's. Here we go, my one-minute rant. Play VS, I love you, but could you stop adding titles? <laughs> could you just stop? I feel like a track coach by myself. I have got, what, seven, eight games right now? Eight. Over th- eight, eight games right now, and I know you're going to add one next week. I know you are. You just don't want to tell us. You're going to add one. You're going to add an eSport, and I'm going to be going, where am I going to put them? So this is my rant. If you add one, take one away for a little while. Let's just swap them out a little bit, please. And I am just, you know, I want all my eSports coaches out there to be paid. We need paid eSports coaches, guys. We need these guys who want to do this and ladies and get everybody involved and let's pay these people. That's my rant. Do I have time left? Yeah, yeah, you do. Oh you my do. gosh, I have you, more to rant about. You do have time left. You have like 10 seconds left. Happy birthday to Ashley. Happy birthday to Ashley. It's Ashley's birthday. Everybody celebrate Ashley. All right, your minute's up. But that wasn't, that last part wasn't a rant. But <laughs> at the time of airing this episode, which is January 25th, I am indeed 31 years old. Bum, bum, bum. And I'm celebrating my birthday by working be, because I am so dedicated 
to this podcast and the vision of what we're doing. Yes, we are dedicated. We're also committed. Got to be committed at this point. Um, our season starts next week, and honestly, it snuck up on me. Ashley, how do you feel about that? Yeah, that look that was me today. <laughs> I had, and I'm and I'm not bragging. I had so many great kids today, and I'm just going, "How am I going to get it all done? How am I going to get it all done? How am I going to get it all done?" And just trying to shrink away. Shout outs to my 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 guys, Frankie and Daniel, for coming in and doing their thing and keeping me straight because who it's going to be a long season. Ooh. I do have some exciting news. Exciting news? Yes, 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 yes. I now have a co-coach. Nice, nice. Um, his name is Mr. Sanders, and he is the flag football coach, and they just won the state championship for flag football. So during his off season, he has decided to help out yours truly run esports, which I'm super I mean. excited about because it's another adult in the room. <laughs> I just I like to say you just can't like to surround yourself with champions because you know me, this Sanders guy, I me, mean, <laughs> we just come along. No, maybe awesome. maybe maybe one day I'll I'll taste that sweet 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 taste of championship. Hey, you know if you ever if anyone ever checks out my pick on any social media, you see me holding that trophy. Um, it is my go-to pick for everything. No, it it's a it's a long season coming up. It's a long season. It's a short season, but it's going to be a long season. It's whew, three days a week of games, and wow. Yeah, wow. And, you know, some some people watching this might say, well, you know, just because they offer all eight games, you don't have to play all eight games. But, you know, the deal is the more games you offer, the more children you're going to get and the more variety of student you're going to get. So you don't really want to exclude like any group of student, uh, yes, it puts more stress on us, especially if you're just running a program by yourself, but it's worth it. It's worth it to me to be stressed out on those days and trying to yep. run multiple games at once just to see that they're having fun because that might be the only time they have fun, and that's important to me. I'm not saying that their lives no. are like terrible, but it just might be that's their their moment, their, their, happy, their happy place. Well, and I also want to say this. I ranted about play VS. I'm going to give them credit. They have spread out the games better this season than in the past. We, we, I think we, the most we have on one day is two, where in the past we've had like three or four in a day. So big shout out to them for spreading the, spreading the wealth on days when it comes to competition. So I also want to thank our guest, Mr. Cody Daniels of Endgame Esports. Awesome guest. What a great interview. It was. It was. Um... You know, storytelling, it's very important. You know, we've been storytelling animals since the beginning. You know, cavemen drew drew paintings and drawings on the walls and told stories. And here we are, you know, just telling stories through through video games, through digital mediums. Yep. And I think as someone who we both are very passionate about literature, the next step is making this a part of literature, getting it out there, especially these lore-based games getting them out there, getting people to understand it. it. It is important to a lot of people. It is a common experience, just like any good book or any good television show or anything else out there. The medium has, our, our media diets have to expand. And if it's something that reaches a kid, then by gosh, it needs to be a part of the curriculum. And honestly, most of them play games, whether it's console, PC, or just on their phone. Yep. And, you know, games are just a great method of storytelling. I remember when I first played Bioshock mm -hmm. and you know this is not going to be a spoiler because god that game's so old <laughs> um you know when you're following Atlas and he's telling you to go through all these things you're like okay he's my friend he's guiding me and then at the end you know when you find out that he's you know <laughs> not real oh. and you've been manipulated the entire time I cried I was like what is this Oh, look, I, from any of the Final Fantasy games to Ogre Battle to any of the stuff I've played, there were games that I got so emotionally involved that it, like, messed my life up a little bit. And don't even get me started in my World of Warcraft days. The Last of Us, that game will wreck you. Oh, gosh. <laughs> uh, I mean, there's life, so many out there. Life is strange. If if you haven't played that series, oh, my, oh my goodness. I just, it's so sad. <laughs> but it's so good right. it's so good 
Uh, and it's a, it's a game. It's a game that makes you feel those emotions. So imagine children who can like better process emotions because they experience that through a digital medium. Well, I mean, I, again, to shout out my buddy Billy, who, who listens, may, you know, who listens to this, our first experience with Resident Evil and the storytelling narrative in that very first raw PlayStation 1 game where it, you're just, oh my gosh, I, we made up stories to go along with the story. It was just that much fun. And I think, you know, that's what gaming is going to bring is it's going to bring us back to some common experiences. And I'm glad to see a company like Endgame really looking at helping coaches create that narrative, get out there and reach more people. Yeah. Big shout out to Cody Daniels, folks. This has been the Esports Report. I'm your host, Will Nix. Ashley, tell them bye. Bye. Check us out next time. Subscribe. 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 <laughs>